Good morning. Today is Monday, October 28, 2024. Vayihi kol haaretz safa udvarim achadim. It was that everyone in the land spoke one language and used uniform words. This is a narrative near the end of this week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Noach. It's a very mysterious, difficult to understand passage. First of all, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with everybody speaking one language and using the same words? Clearly something wrong is happening. We'll see from the context, but what was wrong about it? People moved eastward and they settled in a place. And one person said to the other, Let's make building materials. Let's make bricks. And they said, Let's build the city. Again, what's wrong with that? I mean, building a city is a normal thing. What's wrong with building a city? Umigdal, and we'll build a tower. Verosho Bashamayim, and the top of the tower will be in heaven. What does that mean? Uh, does it mean literally in the spiritual heaven? Does it mean very high, like a skyscraper? What is wrong with that? Why is that a bad thing? Vanasu lanu shame. And we'll make for ourselves a name. Pen al in order not to be scattered all over the world. Instead of people being scattered all over, each one living on their own, let's gather together. We'll build a city, a big tower, and we'll be together. What's wrong with that? Why is that bad? Why is why does it turn out so badly? We have discussed this a number of times, and commentators offer a wide range of answers to try to understand what it was these people were doing and why it was so bad. Let's leave that to the side for now and concentrate only on the next detail. The next Pasuk says, Vayered Hashem, and God descended to see the city and the tower that these people were building. And we know the rest of the story. God was displeased and God confused the language among them and caused them to scatter and to um, leave to 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 leave this project unfinished, and this was called bavel. Bavel is a word that includes the Hebrew word balal, mean to mix together, to mix different things together, people of different languages together, and from there they spread out to all over the land. Why was God upset again? What exactly is God's reaction? How does this make things better to scatter people all around? Again, let's leave all that to the side and just focus on this one detail. God descended to see the city and the tower. Now the question is obvious. God knew what was happening. God doesn't need to descend. God is all-knowing. Why does the Torah say that God descended to see the tower? Why didn't, I mean, God obviously knew whatever it was to know wherever God was without descending, whatever descending means. Why does God descend? 
Rashi says something incredible. Rashi says, This comes to teach a lesson to judges, human judges. That they should not proclaim a defendant guilty until they see and understand for themselves what happened. They have to hear the evidence, the testimony. They have to see the evidence. They can't just do it based on hearsay. They can't just do it based on what they imagine happened. They have to descend. They have to get the facts directly in order to adjudicate a case. So, we have a lesson about how judges are supposed to work when they adjudicate cases in court. But our rabbis go further than that. Our rabbis in the Midrash go further than Rashi, and they say that the lesson is more general. In fact, it is global and comprehensive. It is a lesson that any person should not come to a conclusion about any other person on any matter unless they have first seen or heard firsthand directly what happened. Don't make assumptions. Make sure you know the facts before you speak and that you know the facts directly. This is so, so incredibly relevant to our society. Before you say something about a situation, about a person, know the facts directly, not from someone else, not slanted, not what your preconceived notions are, what you know directly. Otherwise, stay quiet. So it's not only about judges, it's about every single one of us. And this happens so much. It's so common. The United States is in the last week of an election. Doesn't matter what side you support. But if people would just listen to this one piece of advice, the whole country would be different. And the same thing applies here in Canada. And it certainly applies in Israel. It applies everywhere in the world. Because so often today, we say things, we hold opinions, and we don't do it based on facts. We do it based on what someone else told us, what our impression is. And it's in every area of life. I get criticized. How come you didn't come visit me in the hospital? I was sick. I was in the hospital. Rabbi, how come you didn't come visit me? I say, I'm very sorry I didn't visit you. I hope you're feeling better. I would certainly come visit you if it ever happens again. But I didn't know you were in the hospital. Oh, come on, Rabbi. You certainly knew that I was in the hospital. You had to have known. Okay? Uh, But I don't have to have known. (laughs) Many times I don't know. I tried to visit people who are in the hospital. But this person is convinced that A, I knew they were in the hospital, and B, I didn't care about them, and that's why I didn't come. It's in every profession, every job, every situation in life. But of course, if I don't know someone's in the hospital... I can't visit them. I don't know. But here's what's really astounding about this. So this lesson is so important, but it is astounding that God would choose to teach this lesson in a way that could be misunderstood. Because if you just look at the words and you read God descended to see what was happening in the city. You could derive from that, if you did not accept 
the principles of our understanding of God, you could imagine, well, must be that God is in some faraway place. God has no idea of what's happening in this world. And in order for God to know what's happening with these people, God has to descend. He's got to come visit. He's got to, God is not omniscient, obviously, because he has to descend to see what's going on. God forbid. We know that's not true. But God is willing to write the Torah in a way that someone could make this misunderstanding, and it's not so far-fetched that a person would make this misunderstanding, but it is so important to God to teach us this lesson. God doesn't need the lesson, right? Because God clearly did know what was happening without descending, whatever that means for God. But God is willing to write something in the Torah that could be misunderstood in order to teach us a lesson. Don't ever decide something before you come and see it for yourself, before you know for yourself the facts. It's the risk that God is willing to take in order to teach us this lesson that is astounding. In my first rabbinic job, it was um, a full-time job and a part-time salary. So I had a couple of other part-time jobs to help make ends meet. And one of the part-time jobs I had, I was hired by the Hebrew Academy, the Jewish Day School in New Orleans at that time. I was hired to be the fifth grade Hebrew teacher. What were my qualifications for being the fifth grade Hebrew teacher at this school? None. I had no experience teaching this age. I could study Talmud, but I had no idea of what I was doing, why they hired me, I guess I was breathing. In any event, I had a small class and I was teaching, I don't even remember whatever I was teaching, maybe it was Chumash, I don't remember. Small class and there was a boy, fifth grade, there was a boy who was giving me some trouble. He was acting up in class and and I had no experience in how to handle a class. I had no experience with students who wouldn't pay attention or were disrespectful. I had, I had no idea. So I went to speak to the principal and I said, you know, I really need some help. I've got this student, this boy in my class. I can't get him to listen. I can't get him to pay attention. He disrupts the rest of the class. I need help. Just please, what do I do? So the principal said to me, you know about his father, right? And I said, no, I have no idea about his father. So she said, well, you should know about his father. His family came from Iran. They left a few years after the revolution as many Iranian Jews did. Their father, so his mother and siblings and this boy all left. Their father stayed behind in order to tie up some business. And as soon as the father was ready to leave, the borders were closed and he was unable to leave. So this family, mother and several children, were living with great difficulty and trying somehow to get their husband and father out of Iran. And I realized this boy He's dealing with stuff that I, I never, first of all, I never imagined. Second of all, it's nowhere within my experience. 
So after class one day, I asked to speak to him. I said, you know, um, tell me uh, what's going on at home. How are things going at home? And he told me. And I said to him, um, what could I do to help? I want to help. And again, I was a kid. I, does, I'm not exaggerating. I didn't know anything. I said, what could I do to help? And he said, well, if you can help my father get out of Iran, that's what we need. The idea of me being involved in getting a Jewish man out of Iran at that time is as far-fetched as me traveling to Mars. I mean, it just... But I actually did get involved. And I actually was part of a team that eventually got this man out of Iran and reunited with his family. Now, that's not why I'm telling you this. Although I do know about the secret routes people used to travel to get out of Iran in the early 1980s. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is once I understood what this boy was going through, and once he knew that I understood and that I wanted to help he was a completely different boy. He was paying attention. He was learning. He was respectful. Because I understood what was not at all obvious unless I looked into it. We have no idea what other people are going through unless we know it for ourselves, unless we hear it for ourselves, unless we see it for ourselves, we have no idea. And even if we know it and see it and hear it, we often still don't have any idea. Heather Thompson Day is a teacher with many years of experience. And she once wrote, early in my career, I had a student come late to class. Sorry I was late, my mom died this morning. I didn't know where to go. So I came here. And Heather Thompson Day writes, It changed how I teach forever. That's when I decided to treat every single student as if I had no idea what they were going through. And this is always true. That's why this lesson that God teaches us, even at the risk of being misunderstood, is so important because it's always true. Especially now. People are going through things. People are going through fear, fear of anti-Semitism, anxiety, worry. People are going through crises of faith. I heard from a number of people over the last number of weeks. Crises of faith. Where was God? How can I believe in God? And those are good questions. I have the same questions. But people are broken by these questions. People are, 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 are suffering because of these fears, this loss, these pains both in our national world and also in our personal lives. It's always true, and it's especially true now. We have no idea what others are going through. We cannot imagine. And therefore, the only way to be genuine in this world is to be like God. Don't rush to judge. Descend, listen, see, verify, and even then, be very cautious because we just don't know what's going on. 
My friends, I wish you a great day, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.